Hello, friends. Welcome back to Freakish Fridays. Tattooed Biker here with you. And in tonight's video, we're diving into a fascinating incident covered by the late journalist John Keel. Known for his exploration of the unexplained and the supernatural, Keel's work continues to captivate us to this day. Tonight, we're exploring an incident that took place in Gaffney, a small town with a big mystery. The Gaffney incident, as documented by Keel, is a story filled with strange occurrences, unexplained phenomena, and a community left questioning their very reality. In this video, I'll be reading from Keel's account, sharing his investigation into the events that unfolded during this incident. From eyewitness testimonies to bizarre occurrences, we'll explore the chilling moments that left Gaffney bewildered and forever changed. So grab a cup of tea, kick back and enjoy the ride to Gaffney, South Carolina, through the eyes of John Keel. This story was originally compiled by John Keel, born John Alva Keel, born March 25th, 1930, and who sadly passed away July 3rd, 2009, who was an American journalist, influential UFO researcher, and is best known as author of the Mothman Prophecies. On the night of November 16th and 17th of 1966, an intensive meteor shower was visible in many parts of the United States. Excellent press coverage prior to the event prompted millions of people to spend the evening outdoors watching the display. The city of New York even organized a huge Falling Stars party in a major park, but overcast skies in the area spoiled the view. UFO researchers braced themselves for a wave of mistaken sightings and misinterpretations of the phenomena. It may be significant that not a single false report was received that evening. In fact, only one sighting was reported, and that was the story of two police officers encountering a little man in South Carolina. The following evening, on November 17th, two schoolgirls from Coryville, Pennsylvania, reported seeing a low-level white and green object. Two days later, on November 19th, a flap broke out in six states. Ohio, Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona, Kansas, and Michigan. The Michigan sightings were accompanied by power failures throughout the state. Although the meteor showers failed to inspire an outburst of Menzel-type sightings, and perhaps this does prove that the public really knows the difference between natural phenomena and UFOs, the report of the two police officers more than made up for the lack of other reports. Patrolman A.G. Husky and Charles Hutchins were on a routine cruise around Gaffney, South Carolina around 4 a.m. on the morning of November 17th when, according to their story, they suddenly saw a circular machine land and a little man step out to have a brief and strange chat with them. They dutifully reported the encounter to the Gaffney police chief, and it quickly leaked out to the local newspapers. The story wasn't widely circulated outside of Gaffney, however, and few UFO researchers had even heard of it until it was mentioned in the April 1967 issue of Fate magazine. In November 1967, I found myself in Atlanta, Georgia, only about 200 miles away from Gaffney, and I decided to drive through South Carolina and seek out these two men. As is my practice, my first stop was a visit to the local newspaper office, the Gaffney Ledger, where I presented my press credentials to the managing editor, Jack Trulove, and discussed the case. He told me that he received very few UFO sightings and tended to avoid publishing them, particularly since Hutchins and Husky had been exposed to so much ridicule after their story appeared. Later, however, I learned that there had been extensive sightings throughout the entire area in the last few years, particularly around the village of Blacksburg to the north and Gastonia, North Carolina, a few miles southwest of Charlotte, North Carolina. The editor of the Gastonia Gazette was to tell me 
He had been receiving at least one UFO report per day for the past year, but he only bothered to print two or three a month. Mr. Truelove phoned Officer Hutchins and arranged a meeting for later that evening. A.G. Husky had resigned from the police force a few months earlier and was now operating a local business. At the appointed time, I drove to the Gaffney police station, where I found Officer Hutchins standing outside waiting for me in the bitter cold. He regarded me with some suspicion at first, asking for assurance that I wasn't with the government. He had heard of the well-publicized tragedy of the Ohio police officer Dale Spar, who had suffered all kinds of unpleasantness after being involved in the celebrated Ohio UFO chase of April 1966. I handed my credentials to him, showed him a number of my published UFO articles, including magazines which contained my picture, and he relaxed and became cooperative and talkative. A robust man, stocky, about 5'10 and somewhere in his early 30s, Officer Hutchins quickly revealed a healthy sense of humor and, unlike many police officers, didn't seem to take himself too seriously. We adjourned to an empty room inside the police station where I set up my portable tape recorder and began the interview. He began with a confession. The little man hadn't had a green complexion, as was reported in the newspapers, he said. When he and Husky had first told their story, they had been subjected to so many jeers that they deliberately added the green complexion part. Actually, he admitted, the creature's face seemed rather ordinary and human-like, and neither man was able to tell whether his complexion was light or dark. Hutchins had been on the Gaffney Police Force for about six months at the time, and Husky had been a policeman for five years. He could no longer remember the exact date, but... He did remember they had been watching an unusual number of falling stars all evening. Some time after 4 a.m., the newspaper stories gave the time as 4.45 a.m., they were making a routine patrol along the isolated and unpopulated road through an outlying section of Gaffney, known as the West Buford Street Extension, when, as they neared a right-angle bend in the road, they suddenly saw a metallic object directly in front of them. This object was descending and was about 20 feet above the ground when they first saw it. Hutchins described it as being spherical, like a ball, with a wide, flat rim around it. There were no portholes or lights visible. It was completely dark, reflecting a dull gold color in the headlights of the police car. As the object settled to within a few feet of the ground, both men got out of their car in a state of amazement. Later, Hutchins estimated that the object must have been about 20 feet in diameter. A small door suddenly opened, noiselessly, on the underside of the sphere and a short ladder, four to six feet long, drops down. White light poured out of the opening, but neither man could see anything in the interior. A figure appeared in the doorway, descended the ladder, and walked slowly and deliberately toward the two police officers. When the figure reached a point about 15 or 20 feet from the men, it stopped. He didn't move stiffly, Officer Hutchins told me. He moved just like anybody else, but kind of slow, like he was taking his time. He wasn't scared of us or anything like that. In appearance, he was about the size of a 12-year-old boy, maybe four feet tall. He wore no helmet or headgear, and was dressed in a gold suit with no buttons or zippers. His costume was shiny like metal, in the reflection of the headlights anyway. It wasn't self-luminous. We were both kind of shaky and scared, Hutchins admitted, so he did most of the talking. When we asked him questions, he wouldn't answer us, but he just went right on talking. Hutchins couldn't remember seeing the feet of the creature. It was standing in high grass, and the feet must have been hidden. Unfortunately, since my interview took place a full year after the incident, both men had understandably forgotten small details. They couldn't even remember the full context of the conversation. He talked real good, like a college graduate, Hutchins claims. Didn't have an accent or anything. He acted like he knew exactly what he was saying and doing. 
didn't make any quick moves or false moves. He just stood there and talked to us. What exactly was said? Officer Hutchins thinks that he stammered out a question like, What are you doing here? The creature didn't reply, but asked a question of his own. He wanted to know why we were both dressed alike, Hutchins says. So I guess we told him that we were police officers. His speech was very precise. He pronounced each word very carefully. I can't remember everything he said now, but it wasn't anything very important. I think I asked him where he was from, but he didn't answer. He just laughed. He had a kind of funny laugh. The confrontation was brief, perhaps only two or three minutes. Then the creature suddenly announced, I will return in two days. He turned walked slowly back to the ladder, climbed into the object, the door closed and the craft began to whir. It wasn't like whirring sounds in science fiction movies. There was no screech to it. It was soft, like an engine with a muffler on it. The object rose slowly into the air and then vanished into the black sky. The two policemen stood there for a few minutes in stunned silence before they finally pulled themselves together and returned to the police station. They returned to the site the next day with a local councilman named Hill and found several fresh footprints in the exact spot where the little man had stood. They looked like children's footprints, he said, but no casts were made. After the story had appeared in the local papers, both men were subjected to considerable ridicule, but neither one received any hoax phone calls or crank letters. However, about two weeks after the incident, two strangers turned up in Gaffney, made a few inquiries, and called Hutchins from a local restaurant. They said they were doctors of some kind, Hutchins told me. I think they were from the government or something. By that time, both of us were fed up with the whole business, and we didn't want to talk about it anymore. I told those fellows we couldn't see them. These two strangers were apparently not very persistent. They went away and neither man was approached by any investigator of any kind. Later, I spoke to A.G. Husky on the phone. I never met him personally. He confirmed Hutchins' story, recited the same details, but showed a great deal of reluctance. He wanted to forget the whole thing. He had left the force after suffering an accident, totally unrelated to UFOs, and now operates his own business in Gaffney. Hutchins appeared to be a straightforward, honest eyewitness. There were many details he couldn't remember, and he didn't seem to attempt to embellish his story at all. His reputation in Gaffney is excellent. Careful cross-examination failed to uncover any discrepancies in his narrative. He told it like it happened, no more and no less. Accompanied by Hutchins and another police officer, I carefully inspected the site of the alleged landing. It looked very familiar to me, for I've stood in a hundred similar, if not identical, places during my investigations over the last two years. The West Buford Street extension is a desolate place, covered with thickets and trees. There's maybe only one house in the area, and that is some distance from the site. As Dr. Jacques Vallée noted in his study of the 1954 French landings, most of these incidents occur in isolated thinly populated areas. The object came down directly in front of a telephone pole, which sits about 50 feet from the bend in the road. The two officers took a few steps forward from their car, but made no attempt to approach the entity. Their voices could have carried easily for 15 or 20 feet in the still night air. I now have in my possession two remarkable photographs of little men. One was taken at Oriental, North Carolina, in the summer of 1967. The other was taken in Lambertville, New Jersey, in September of 1967. I'm currently running a complete check on the photographers and so on. If their stories are true, it would appear that in both cases, the little men were not only aware they were being photographed, but deliberately posed for the photographers. In this Gaffney, South Carolina incident, it also seems as if the contact was a very deliberate one. 
At 4 a.m. that morning, there was probably little to no life in Gaffney, and the cruising police car moving casually along a deserted road in an isolated area would have been most conspicuous. If the UFO knots had wanted to make deliberate contact in the area, this was an ideal situation. In view of the many other incidents now coming to our attention, such as low-level flights over cities and towns, and a steadily increasing number of landings and contacts, we might assume that the UFOs are finally coming out of hiding and beginning to make their presence known in a very deliberate manner. They don't seem especially interested in communicating important information to us, but they do seem to desire notice and attention. Neither Hutchins nor Husky had read any UFO literature before the incident, nor do they seem very interested in such literature now. They weren't aware of the numerous other far-flung contactee stories in which the witnesses also reported that the UFO knots declared that they would return at a specific time. Both men revisited the landing site nightly for two weeks after the incident without seeing anything unusual. However, they did see a large orange ball sailing across the sky a few days later. A woman in Gaffney has been complaining to the police that her house has been haunted for the past year. She lives alone in the heart of town and insists that a strange but oppressive electronic sound frequently permeates the house and seems to wrap around her. No one takes her seriously, even though others have reported hearing and feeling this sound when they visit her. Farther north around Gastonia, North Carolina, low-level sightings are continuous in the vicinity of Spencer Mountain, a high hill topped with radio and TV antenna. There's also been an epidemic of haunted houses in that area in the past year or two. The strange sound of a baby crying has been frequently heard in old cemeteries at night. While in Gastonia, I checked into one fresh report. A Miss Dolores Jameson said she had been seeing a brilliantly illuminated object flashing red and blue lights maneuvering over the end of North Broad Street. I visited the spot and discovered that the object must have been hovering directly above Hollywood Cemetery. Cemetery sightings have become commonplace throughout the world, perhaps because cemeteries are deserted at night and offer excellent landing space. Gradually, the pieces of this enormous puzzle are falling into place. By John Keel and there it is, all I have on the Gaffney incident, as documented by the late, great John Keel. I hope you enjoyed this captivating story and the eerie events that sent shockwaves through the town of Gaffney. John Keel's work continues to remind us that the world is a mysterious place, filled with unknown forces and unexplained phenomena. The Gaffney incident serves as a reminder that there are still countless mysteries waiting to be unraveled. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and joining our community of fellow truth seekers. By subscribing and hitting the notification bell, you'll never miss out on the latest investigations into the unexplained, unsolved, and the supernatural. So thanks again. Until next time, stay curious, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I'll be seeing you soon on Down the Road a Ways. Biker. Out.